that video is no, called. Wait, no, wait a second, Senator Hawkins, just a minute. No, this is a very uh, large crowd today. We have allowed people in beyond the capacity of this room. We're not going to have any demonstrations, no applause, no demonstrations of any kind. I thank the chairman. The title of that tape was Hot for Teacher. And we will uh, the, give each senator a copy of the words. They'll promise not to distribute them beyond their own possession. Uh, the next video the, is by the group Twisted Sister. And we'll show you a brief a portion of that. These are very popular videos. Pass the carrots, please.
Mr. Chairman, I think a uh, picture's worth a thousand words. This issue is too hot not to cool down. Parents are asking for assistance. And I hope we always remember that no success in life would compensate for failure in the home. Senator Hawkins, thank you very much. The uh, next, uh, next we have uh, Mr. D. Snyder, the Twisted Sister, Free Fall Talent Group. What? Not the Twisted Sister. Yep. That's the group. Oh, this is one of the people. Mr. Snyder, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me here. I don't know if it's morning or afternoon, but I'll say both good morning and good afternoon. My name is D. Snyder, that's S N I D E R. I have been asked to come here to present my views on, quote, the subject of the content of certain sound recordings and suggestions that recording packages be labeled to provide a warning to prospective purchasers of sexually explicit or other potentially offensive content, unquote. Before I get into that, I'd like to tell the committee a little bit about myself. I'm 30 years old, I'm married, I have a three-year-old son. I was born and raised a Christian and I still adhere to those principles. Believe it or not, I do not drink, I do not smoke, and I do not do drugs. I do play in and write the songs for a rock and roll band named Twisted Sister that is classified as heavy metal. And I pride myself on writing songs that are consistent with my above mentioned beliefs. There are many facets to this complex issue and time does not permit me to address all of them. However, my feelings are expressed for the most part by the August 8th, 1985 letter to the Parents Music Resource Center from Mr. Stanley Gordikoff, President of the Recording Industry Association of America. This letter was a formal response to the PMRC's petition of the RIAA. The only part of this document I do not support is Mr. Gordikoff's unnecessary and unfortunate decision to agree to a so-called generic label on some selected records. In my opinion, this should be retracted. Since I seem to be the only person addressing this committee today who has been a direct target of accusations from the presumably responsible PMRC, I would like to use this occasion to speak on a more personal note and show just how unfair the whole concept of lyrical interpretation and judgment can be and how many times this can amount to little more than character assassination. I have taken the liberty of distributing to you material and lyrics pertaining to these accusations. There were three attacks in particular which I would like to address. Accusation number one. This attack was contained in an article written by Tipper Gore, which was given the form of a full page in my hometown newspaper on Long Island. In this article, Ms. Gore claimed that one of my songs, Under the Blade, had lyrics encouraging sadomasochism, bondage, and rape. The lyrics she quoted have absolutely nothing to do with these topics. On the contrary, the words in question are about surgery and the fear that it instills in people. Furthermore, the reader of this article is led to believe that the three lines she quotes go together in the song, when as you can see from reading the lyrics, the first two lines she cites are an edited phrase from the second verse, and the third line is a misquote of a line from the chorus. That the writer could misquote me is curious, since we make it a point to print all our lyrics on the inner sleeve of every album. As the creator of Under the Blade, I can say categorically that the only sadomasochism, bondage, and rape in this song is in the mind of Ms. Gore. Accusation number two. 
the PMRC has made, a public, made public a list of 15 of what they feel are some of the most blatant songs lyrically. On this list is our song, We're Not Gonna Take It, upon which has been stowed a V rating indicating violent lyrical content. You'll note from the lyrics before you that there is absolutely no violence of any type either sung about or implied anywhere in the song. Now, it strikes me that the PMRC may have confused our video presentation for this song with the meaning of the lyrics. It's no secret that videos often depict storylines completely unrelated to the lyrics of the song they accompany. The video for We're Not Gonna Take It was simply meant to be a cartoon with human actors playing variations on the Roadrunner Wild E. Coyote theme. Each stunt was selected from my extensive personal collection of cartoons. You'll note when you watch the entire video that after each catastrophe our villain suffers through, in the next sequence he reappears unharmed by any previous attack, no worse for the wear. By the way, I'm very pleased to note that the United Way of America has been granted a request to use portions of our We're Not Gonna Take It video in a program they are producing on the subject of the changing American family. They asked for it because of its, yeah. they asked of it because of its quote, light-hearted way of talking about communicating with teenagers, unquote. It is gratifying that an organization as respected as the United Way of America appreciates where we're coming from. I've included a copy of the United Way's request as part of my written testimony. Thank you, United Way. <laughs> Accusation number three. Last Tuesday, a public forum regarding the lyric controversy was held in New York. Among the panelists was Ms. Gore. Trying to stem the virtual tidal wave of anti-rating sentiment coming from the audience, Ms. Gore made the following statement, quote, I agree this is a small percentage of all music, thank goodness, but it's becoming more mainstream. You look at even the t-shirts the kids are wearing and you see Twisted Sister and a woman in handcuffs sort of spread-eagled, unquote. This is an outright lie. Not only have we never sold a shirt of this type, we have always taken great pains to steer clear of sexism in our merchandise, records, stage show, and personal lives. Furthermore, we have always promoted the belief that rock and roll should not be sexist, but should cater to males and females equally. I feel that an accusation of this type is irresponsible, damaging to our reputation, and slanderous. I defy Ms. Gore, to, Ms. Gore sorry, to produce such a shirt to back up her claim. I'm tired of running into kids on the street who tell me that they can't play our records anymore because of the misinformation their parents are being fed by the PMRC on TV and in the newspapers. These are the only three accusations I've come across. All three are totally unfounded. Who knows what other false and irresponsible things have been said about me or my band. There happens to be one area where I'm in complete agreement with the PMRC, as well as the national PTA, and probably most of the parents on this committee. That is, it is my job as a parent to monitor what my children see, hear, and read during their preteen years. The full responsibility for this falls on the shoulders of my wife and I, because there is no one else capable of making these judgments for us. Parents can thank the PMRC for reminding them that there is no substitute for parental guidance, but that is where the PMRC's job ends. The beauty of literature, poetry, and music is that they leave room for the audience to put its own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the words. The examples I cited earlier showed clear evidence of Twisted Sisters music being completely misinterpreted and unfairly judged by supposedly well-informed adults. We cannot allow this to continue. There is no authority who has the right or the necessary insight to make these judgments. Not myself, not the federal government, not some recording industry committee, not the PTA, not the RIAA, and certainly not the PMRC. I'd like to thank the committee for this time, and I hope my testimony will aid you in clearing up this issue. Thank you, Mr. Snyder. I get a glass with some water, please? Thank you. Yeah, you yeah, you're a cameraman, you can do it. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. Sorry. Mr. Snyder, let's suppose that there is music which, um, say, glorifies incest, not yours. Let's Thank suppose you. that there is some music that glorifies incest. Do you think that, um, do you think parents should, should know about it? Or do you think that it's just a matter between uh, whoever is selling the record and, and whoever is buying it? As I said in my testimony, I think it's very important that parents be aware of that these, these lyrics exist. How, how could they find out about it? Well, quite simply, as a parent myself and as a rock fan, I know that when I see an album cover with a severed goat's head in the middle of a pentagram between a woman's legs, that it's not the kind of album I want my son to be listening to. Right. Uh, if I read a title on the back of, say, somebody said, Ice Cream Castle, uh, a title called uh, If the Kid Can't Make You Come, whatever it is, I realize that's a sexually explicit song. By just looking at the cover, looking at the lyrics, looking at the, I should say, the uh, titles, that should cover just about all bases. The few albums that do not express their intentions on the cover or in the song titles, I think a parent could listen, take it home, listen to it, and I don't think there's too many retail stores that would deny them the ability to return the album for something different. Do you think that, um, that most parents or even the kids for that matter know everything that's on an album when, they buy an, when, when a child buys an album? I don't know half the things that are on half the albums I own. Right. Some of the bands I listen to, I listen for musical reasons. Other bands I listen to for lyrical reasons. Uh, I know that ACDC, one of my favorite bands, sings a lot of songs glorifying hell and damnation. I'm a Christian, I don't believe in, uh, I don't want to go to hell and I don't want to be damned for all time, but I do like the feel of the songs. The lyrics have no effect on me. Other bands who have more to say, I listen to their words and I learn from their words. Do you think that now there is adequate basis for parents to know what's on the records that their kids are buying? I think if they really are concerned, there is. But uh, quite honestly, I don't think that uh, the majority of parents are in reality as concerned as the PMRC or myself. Uh, I don't think they really want to spend the time to listen to what they might consider to be uh, a bunch of noise. Uh, you know, they, don't, they, they put it on and they can't understand the thing that's being said anyway. So I think most of them won't, don't spend enough time with it. Senator Hollings? Uh, yes, Mr. Snyder, I think I'll just take the opportunity to make an observation because uh, you and I would differ as to what's obscene or what's shocking or what's vulgar. And uh, persons of goodwill will differ on that particular score. I think that somewhere in this hearing record, we should not be on the defensive and we shouldn't uh, create the atmosphere that we're powerless. The absolute uh, nature of your statement uh, that we don't have any authority, I only want to refer everyone to the Pacifica Foundation case where the Federal Communications Commission was questioned as to its power to regulate public radio TV broadcasts that was indecent but not obscene. You see, they differed between what was indecent, what was obscene, and what was shocking. They had the seven dirty words. I think everyone remembers that case on the West Coast. And the Supreme Court of the United States found out positively the FCC had the authority, had the responsibility. And I'm quoting from the language of the Supreme Court, patently offensive, indecent material presented over the airwaves confronts the citizen not only in public, but also in the privacy of the home where the individual's right to be left alone plainly outweighs the First Amendment rights of an intruder. So this isn't just a forum to rally one way or the other and hope something happens. This is a forum with a definite responsibility with respect to Congress and enunciating the duties of the Federal Communications Commission, which have been constitutionally followed. So. I understand your opinion, and that's why we invited you up here to hear your words and not mine, but I think that the general nature of all this testimony of nothing censorship, First Amendment absolutism, does not pertain with respect to the broadcast media, and that, of course, the main media, I guess you would agree, to actually sell the records, wouldn't it not be? Uh, yes, except I'd like to clarify something. I said no authority has the right 
or necessary insight. I didn't say you weren't able to. I said you don't have the right, or I don't have the right, or the RIAA. Also, we're talking about the airwaves as opposed to a person going with their money to purchase an album, to play in their room, their home, on their own time. Uh, the airwaves is something different, I think, that the FCC and uh, even MTV have done a fair job in keeping profanity, obscenity, and things like that off the public airwaves. But as far as what you listen to your own home, that's something totally different, I feel. Yeah, I, th I think that record ought to be elaborated to show just that. Previously, about five years ago, six years ago, before this committee, we had the TV networks. And pursuant to that particular hearing, they again came back, I remember specifically CBS, and they demonstrated how they had this film and then they got together with the producer and removed certain scenes of violence and certain four-letter words and did not offend the producer's uh, sense of art and the production itself. So we've made some progress, but bottom line with respect to these particular records, the Supreme Court has found that there is that right and that responsibility. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Gore. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Excuse me, are you going to tell me you're a big fan of my music as well? No, I'm not, uh, I'm not a fan of I'm your sorry, music. I'm sorry, Mr. Gore. I, uh, I'm, w I'm aware that uh, Frank Zappa and John Denver uh, cover quite a spectrum, and I do uh, enjoy them both. I am, am not, however, a fan of Twisted Sister, and uh, I will okay. readily uh, say that. Mr. Snyder, uh, what is the name of your fan club? The fan club is called the SMF Friends of Twisted Sister. And uh, what does SMF uh, stand for when it's uh, spelled out? It stands for the Sick Motherfucking Friends of Twisted Sister. Is this uh, also a Christian group? Uh, I don't believe that profanity has anything to do with Christianity. Thank you. That, uh, it's just an interesting uh, choice for, um, because I was getting the impression from your presentation that you were a very wholesome uh, kind of uh, performer and uh, that is an interesting title for for your fan club in surge you say your song under the blade is uh, about surgery have you ever had uh, surgery with your hands tied and your legs strapped uh, the song was written about my guitar player, Eddie Ojeda. He was having polyps removed from his throat, and he was very fearful of this operation. And I said, Eddie, while you're in the hospital, I'm going to write a song for you. The, I said it was about the fear of operations. I think people imagine being helpless on a table, a bright light in their face, the blade coming down on them, and having no, totally afraid that they may wake up, who knows, dead, handicapped. It's a certain fear of hospitals. That's what, that's in my imagination what I see the hospitals like. Is there a reference to the hospital in the song? No, there isn't, but there isn't a reference to a woman, sadomasochism, or bond, oh, bondage, yes, I'm sorry. There's rape. just a reference to, to someone uh, whose hands are uh, tied down and whose legs are strapped down and he's uh, going under the blade to be uh, cut. Yes, there is. All right. Uh, so it's not uh, really a, uh, a wild uh, leap of the imagination to uh, uh, to jump to the conclusion that that's about something other than uh, surgery or hospitals, uh, neither of which are mentioned in the song. No, it's not a wild jump, and I think uh, I, what I said at one part was that songs allow a person to put their own imagination, experiences, and dreams into the lyrics. Uh, people can interpret it many ways. Uh, Ms. Gore was looking for sadomasochism and bondage, and she found it. Someone looking for surgical references would have found it as well. Yeah. Why do you think there is so much uh, sadomasochism and bondage uh, in some of these new songs? I cannot speak uh, for the other artists. I can really, I'm only here to defend myself and hopefully by speaking for myself as one uh, person, a songwriter in a band that I feel has been unjustly uh, dumped on, uh, that will just warn us of the dangers of what we're trying to do here. Uh, I really can't speak for the other bands. Now, you made uh, reference to a comment about t-shirts. I would simply note, uh, for the record, that uh, the word uh, t-shirts was in plural. And uh, one of them referred to a twisted sister, and the other uh, referred to uh, a woman in handcuffs, and was not intended, uh, as I understand it, to, uh, to say that you appear with a woman in handcuffs. In well, fact, there are a lot of uh, 
a, a lot of different uh, t-shirts and advertisements. In fact, uh, I've noticed from some of the uh, fan magazines uh, of uh, particularly heavy metal that little uh, sadomasochistic uh, outfits are advertised with the uh, uh, fingerless gloves and spikes and studs uh, on them uh, and that uh, these uh, little S&M outfits are marketed to, uh, to uh, teens and preteens. Is that correct? Well, they are marketed. Uh, who buys them, I'm not sure. I'd just like to say, in reference to the comment about T-shirts, I have with me a taped cassette of the exact... No, I'm, I'm reading from your, uh, from your transcript uh, of it uh, in your statement. Uh, I have to check the uh, transcript, but again, I'll say, when it was said, there was no question she was referring to a Twisted Sister T-shirt. There was no question if I played the well, tape for anybody... In, your own, uh, in your own transcript, it's in... It's a plural T-shirts, and uh, two examples are cited, but I don't, uh, I don't want to uh, belabor that point. Now, you said that uh, you can look at the titles of albums and uh, look at the covers and tell what kind of material is inside. Uh, does the title of Purple Rain give you an indication that uh, the material is about masturbation? Do you mean the album title, Purple Rain, yeah. not the song title? Yeah. No, it doesn't. I didn't say in all cases. I yeah. believe I covered that uh, those occasional albums that are a bit misleading. Uh, that, like I said, I don't think a store would uh, refuse a parent who came in and said, I don't like what's on this record. I would like my money back. So, so uh, the choice the parent has, then, is to uh, sit down and listen to every song on the album, right? Or read the lyrics if they're on the record. On what, if they're not on the, uh, I mean, I think there's pretty general agreement that if uh, the lyrics are printed, that's one possible solution for this. Let's suppose the lyrics aren't uh, printed. Then what choice does a parent have? To sit down and listen to every song on the album? Well, if they're really concerned about it, I think that they have to. Do you think that's uh, reasonable to uh, expect parents to do that? Being a parent isn't a reasonable thing. It's a very hard thing. I'm a parent and I know. Okay, I'm a new parent, I only have one child maybe, but I'm learning that there's a lot to being a parent that you didn't expect. It's not just, oh, isn't baby cute. There's a lot of labor and a lot of time and a lot yeah. of effort that goes into it. It's not totally pleasurable. Yeah, and you'll find when they get uh, a little bit older that when they're exposed to the kinds of themes that we uh, were presented with uh, earlier, that uh, if, if you love your child, you're going to be concerned about that. And if you want to protect that child from unnecessary exposure to inappropriate material, you sometimes need a little help, the kind of guidance that is presented to, in the movie industry. And it is totally unreasonable, in my view, to expect parents to come and sit down and listen to every single song in, in the, the albums that their children buy in order to fulfill their responsibilities as parents. Now, uh, the only thing that uh, uh, that uh, I uh, felt at all uh, uh, comfortable about uh, in, uh, in your uh, statement was when you said that you shared uh, some of the concerns of the, uh, of the uh, PMRC. Uh, I would uh, simply hope that, or end by expressing the hope because my time has uh, expired, that uh, artists and record companies will find a way to manifest that concern in some self-restraint and show of responsibility to give parents a break. You're right, it's tough being a parent. Uh, it's even tougher uh, being a kid. Uh, and and uh, if both are going to be able to uh, deal with the kind of material that's coming out in popular music, it seems to me the industry has a responsibility to uh, give them a little help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Rockefeller. <coughs> uh, Mr. Snyder, how would you, uh, do you feel that you have a responsibility as an artist in terms of those words that you write, a responsibility for those who would hear those words. I feel a tremendous responsibility and as I said, uh, I don't put anything down on a record that I can't stand behind with my beliefs 100%. I don't sing about drugs, sex, alcohol, because I don't, I don't, say, I don't uh, advocate sexism, the use of drugs, and drinking. So I don't write about those things. I only write about things I believe in. And, and that's the way you define what your responsibility is? That is, not to, not to write about things that you don't believe in? Uh, yeah, that's about, yeah, that's how I define my responsibility. 
to write about things that you can stand behind. I feel myself to be a moral person, and I think that I have a lot of positive things to tell people about. And uh, everything, like I said, on my records, I will stand there and say, yes, I wrote those words, and this is what it meant, and this is what I was trying to say, yes. Do you think that, um, that uh, parents, not only those who are in PMRC, but other parents who are concerned um, here and across the country about the development of new trends in music and the lyrics that go along with that music are naive or, or um, uh, somehow missing the point? Do you think that they're unduly worried about uh, some of these the developments and writings about sadomasochism, uh, suicide, rape, other things? I mean, do you think that's well, I have really to not that serious a problem for this country and our young people? That's like sort of a multiple question. I don't think they're naive, and I don't think that at times they're unduly worried, but I do think sometimes they take it overly serious. I mean, there are monster movies on all the time. They've been going on for ages, and people watch a monster movie, and they get scared, and they walk away, and it was just a movie. Rock and roll, in many times, is the same thing, trying to get an effect either of laughter, of sadness. A lot of the heavy metal bands are trying to scare people and just make them just like a horror movie. Vincent Price isn't getting, uh, have problems because he's done all these monster pictures. He's just an actor. I'm not going to say I'm just an actor, but I am entertaining people, and a lot of these bands are entertaining people. And when they were reading some of these lyrics before, I couldn't help but laugh. I mean, I hadn't heard some of them, but some of the lyrics were ridiculously ridiculous. I mean, you know, it, and a kid, even a kid reading that, I think would go, oh my God, what's going on? You know, it's ridic ridiculous. It's the only word I could think of. Some of the lyrics. The vehemence with which you attacked um, uh, Senator Gore's wife, I detected sort of a defensiveness some, somehow on your part, uh, sort of a lack of unsureness of where you uh, stand in this. Why, would, why did you feel it necessary to attribute uh, some of the qualities to her that you did? Why, why was that important to your testimony? First of all, I wasn't attacking Senator Gore's wife. I was attacking a member of the PMRC. Okay, I was two... Senator Gore's wife by name. No, her name is Tipper Gore, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, I didn't say the senator's wife. I said Tipper Gore. Okay. Secondly, defensive. I've been working very hard. I believe in the music I play. I believe we have a very bad reputation. I've been doing a lot on my part to try and say, hey, this isn't a bad thing. This is fun. This is fantasy. Kids are coming out. They're screaming. They're yelling. They're letting out their emotions. And they're going home. And they're feeling better because they let out a lot of their frustrations. I, as I said, I pride myself on writing lyrics that are not offensive and that are saying something positive. Most of my songs are about personal freedom. And when somebody tells me, after all I've done to, to fight against sexism, that I've got a shirt with a spread eagle woman, or it says to fight one. All I've done to fight sexism. We don't we steer clear. The whole twisted sister thing is a very ambiguous. Guys wearing makeup, we don't cater, we don't act like women, we act like men, we don't cater to the males or females in the audience. It's just one audience. So when someone says there's a song about sadomasochism and bondage, or someone says we're not going to take it, is violent lyrical content, which is what it's been rated for, yes, I'm defensive. Yes, that gets me angry. I'm trying to get adults to see that heavy metal is not totally a bad thing. How many months in the course of a year do you spend on the road away from home? In the course of a year, it would be tough to say. Over a two-year period, because I would spend uh, about 11 months on the road and 13 months at home recording an album, things like that, doing videos. 11 months on the road in a two-year period? Yeah, because you do a tour and then you go in and record albums. I've been off the road now for you 10 months. you take your child with you? He comes sometimes, some when of the shows. your show. child, nine years from now, when your child is 12 and in school, will you take your child with you? Absolutely. When your child's in school? Oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Thank you for clarifying. No, I would not take him out of school. And how will it be possible for you to, as a responsible parent, to, to spend the time that you suggest uh, going through and listening to these records and finding out what it is that you want your son to listen to and what you don't want him to listen to? To be perfectly honest, nine years from now, I'm going to be well retired. <laughs> and I'm going to be spending... I'll be spending more time with my son than any other parent probably ever spends. That's one of the beautiful things about rock and roll, is that I can retire hopefully at a very early age. But even now, uh, I'm very lucky that I have a wife 
uh, who I've been going with for 10 years now, we've been married for four, uh, who is an incredible mother. And she, when I'm gone, fills the role, has a very difficult job too, of mother and father. Does she go through these, uh, do you expect later on then that she'll be going through these uh, records? I think both of us will be doing that. that, doing that. You, you expect me to believe that? Oh, you can. I'm terminally teenage. I'll be listening to my son's records. and What I'll about uh, parents where both parents have to work, which is an increasing uh, phenomenon in this country now, uh, because they have to survive. And um, the whole notion of parents sitting down and listening to record after record, tape after tape, doesn't that really strike you, and, and that's what you suggested, doesn't that strike you as just a little bit naive and unrealistic? Uh, no, I don't, because I know the reality of, of the record buying market. As a record buyer, uh, with my allowance, I was able to, if, if I was lucky, afford maybe one album a week at the most. Usually it was one a month. Uh, albums cost anywhere from six to ten dollars, and that's a lot of money to a, to a teenager, to a pre-teenager, it's, it's a ridiculous sum. To a teenage kid, you know, that's a, a considerable amount of money. So to listen to one record a week, I don't consider that a, a hardship. May I ask one, just one final question, Mr. Chairman? Bearing in mind that it's 12.30 and we yeah. have a lot of witnesses left, yes. Well, then I won't ask the question. I'll bear that in mind and won't ask the question. Thank you. Senator Pressler. Individual agreement. Uh, one of the big things is artistic freedom in your contract. I don't think the industry can pass a ruling on that. Uh, so your legislative recommendations, would that apply just to, not to broadcast, uh, you would put broadcast and things that are over the airwaves in a different category than things people buy and show in their homes? Well, I think we're talking about the purchase of albums and the lyrical content on the album, so that's what I'm directing it to at this time. Okay, so you would disagree with any action on those albums, be they, be they by private industry or government, any type of uh, labeling? If somebody was to ask me what my opinion was, I had said earlier that I didn't think there would be a problem for a parent to return an album that they had taken home and found it dissatisfactory. Um, I'd like to believe that, but some retail stores will give you a, give you a hassle if you try to return an open album. Uh, if you want a, uh, a solution, maybe they could bring back, in the 50s, you could listen to an album in the store before you purchase the album. Um, most record stores play the albums in the store, and there's usually a stack of those albums opened already that if you wanted to go over and take a glance at the cover, which I've done many times myself, you could go over and do that. So if you want to take some sort of industry action, I would think it would be to force the retail stores to allow people to return product that they're not satisfa satisfied with, satisfaction guaranteed. Thank you very much. Mr. Snyder, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. The next witness is um, the next witness is um, Mrs. Millie Waterman, National PTA Vice President for Legislative Activity.